Okay. Praise his holy and majestic name. I, I, all right. We're going to jump right on in. We're going to get right started with the meat of this thing. We're talking about giant killer or problem solver. Literally being one of those that have made their mind up. You, one of those that you realize you are of God, that God has equipped you and given you the ability to rise to the occasion of the elite. I mean, I mean, you a problem solver for God. You're a giant killer for God. You, you know how to pull down strongholds. You, you know your prayers are effective because you're praying in the name of Jesus to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You know that your praise is potent. That when you start praising and worshiping God, now there's there's nine expressions, nine ways to give God perfect praise. This is how they do it in heaven. And you've discovered them in the scriptures and you are employing them. Every time you pray, every time you seek God, every time you do something for God, you're ending it with the humility of praise and thanksgiving. And you're going through all nine of those expressions. And thank God that you know those nine expressions. And then, and then the humility that you're walking in. I'm telling you right now, when, when, when you start expressing the attitude of God and you can remain humble, when you start expressing the performance abilities and capabilities of God in your situation, in your circumstance, and remain humble, giving God all the praise, the glory, and the honor, when you now have the attitude of God facing Satan, facing Satan's attacks, facing Satan's kids, facing any opposing force against the will of God for your life, what Jesus said you are, who Jesus said you are, what Jesus said you can do, and who Jesus said you can do it to, all in his reputation, all in his character, all in his authority, or in other words, all in his name. When you're manifesting that level of proficiency, that level of just doing it good, doing it right, I'm telling you right now, and expressing the humility, giving God all the praise, exaltation from God in that situation and scenario, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're dealing with from the enemy, whoever you're aligning yourself up with that needs help from God and God uses you as a tool to go in there and stir revival in their hearts, revival in their faith. Revival, glory to God, in their walk with God because of your performance, because of your attitude, like King David, like Noah, like Moses, but most important of all, like Jesus. You see, the attitude of God and the performance of God creates the pathway for God to exalt you, to exalt us. And see, when the enemy comes in, we respond like a tsunami, like a flood against that devil. And I'm telling you right now, as we are now equipping and mastering the attitude of God, dealing with Satan, as we are equipping and mastering the performance of God, dealing with Satan, dealing with tests, dealing with trials, dealing with temptations, dealing with tribulations that are sent against us as attacks from Satan. As we deal with those things with the attitude and the performance of God, we're going to see the power of God released to bring their word and promises to reality in our physical lives, reality in our physical circumstances like never before. And I'm telling you right now, because of your due diligence, you're seeking first the kingdom of God. You're, 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 you're literally imitating Jesus. You're creating the accelerating power and momentum of God to turn your physical circumstances around, to make your physical circumstances and scenarios catch up to the change that's taking place in your life, to the, to the faith that you have in God's word, to the building and the development of God that has been ongoing in your life, ongoing in our lives. We're giant killers. And we're not ashamed of it. And we're not ashamed of the word of God because it is the word of God that's building us. It is the word of God that's developing 
and cultivating the attitude of God in us when we deal with our defeated enemy. And I'm talking about Satan. He is already defeated. And that's the attitude that you have to have. So we, we dealt with some things last week. You really, really need to check out last lesson, the last lesson that we did on this series. And it was powerful. We have progressed. First Samuel chapter 17. We're down now at verse 17. Now I'm going to jump off right there because at verse 17, we're going to start seeing the actual encounter that David had with Goliath. And you may be encountering some serious attacks from the enemy. You may be encountering some serious attacks from the enemy, not so much against you, but maybe against one of your loved ones, one of your friends, even one of your enemies. And you have been positioned by God to bring the answer of God to those individuals who are under the very threat, intimidation, and stronghold of Satan. Not only have you broken the stronghold of the devil over your life, but God says if you want to keep developing, help others break the strongholds of Satan over their lives. Help others to walk in the blessedness of praise, the blessedness of worship, the blessedness of obedience, the blessedness, oh, hallelujah, of triumphing through Jesus Christ. So, verse 17, we're going to jump right in. This war is 40 days, not a stone thrown, not a, not a sword drawn. It's just talk. And Satan's champion, Goliath, is talking major nonsense. He's, we used to call it back in the day, selling wolf tickets. He's talking all kind of disrespectful. He's talking all kind of, you know what I mean, rhetoric about what, what he's going to do to any champion. He's disrespecting God. He's disrespecting the people of God. He's disrespecting the army of God. And every time that champion came up for 40 days, when Saul and the children of Israel, the best of the best of the fighting force of God under Saul's command, turned tail, ran, fled, dismayed, and afraid. And we broke those words down. They, they bowed down and gave that giant respect. They bowed down and worshiped. They, they literally went prostrate before them. They were deathly afraid. They was, they was knocking in their knees afraid. And all Goliath was doing was talking. But they saw the size of Goliath. And they saw and heard the threats of Goliath. And they believed them. That's why there's not one champion that came up out of that crew. There's not one giant killer in Saul's army. But that's not you. That's not you because you are learning and allowing. You're learning and allowing God to build you into a giant killer. Let me just say this again. Giant killers are not born. Giant killers are built. So now, by the time we get to the story, okay, verse 16, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Morning and evening, twice a day, Goliath came out talking for Satan because Goliath was Satan's champion. Goliath represented the king, but he represented Satan. And we saw this in a couple of lessons ago. That what Satan's end game is for you, for me, is to literally conquer us and turn us into Satan worshipers. And that ain't happening. Because I know you like Satan, you must be out your mind. You can sin whatever you want. I'm not denying God. I'm not ashamed of God. And I'm not going to be like Saul's army. I'm going to be like King David. I'm going to be like David, equipped with relationship, equipped with experience, equipped with the knowledge of God. So now, Verse 17, and Jesse said unto his son David, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now, first of all, David didn't go down there on his own. David was sent by his father. Now, I'm telling you right now, your heavenly father is sending you to observe some of the battles that's going on in the lives of believers, in the lives of your family members, 
and the lives of your church family. As you begin to cultivate those relationships and you begin to now, you know what I mean, have care and concern about the welfare, not only of yourself. See, you're good right now because you're fighting. You're good right now because you're battling and you're battling like Jesus. You got the formula of Jesus. You've been studying Jesus and how he dealt with Satan. You've been studying Jesus and how he dealt with Satan's kids. You go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see the interactions that Jesus had with Satan. You see the interactions that Jesus had with Satan's kids. You even see the interactions that Jesus had with God's kids. And we're looking at Jesus as our blueprint. We're looking at Jesus as our consummate, quintessential giant killer because he killed Satan. Oh, he hurt Satan bad. Now, he didn't annihilate Satan, but he stripped Satan of all of his authority, all of his ability to dominate in your life, to dominate in our lives. And I'm so glad about it. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you right now, as we start studying the word and we start seeing what God has promised and what God did in the patriarchs of old, in the, in the, in the old saints or the saints that came before us, and we see that God has not changed. God is backing you. God is for you. And God says, all you got to do is now start not only developing the attitude, cultivating that attitude, but you got to start walking in the attitude of God. So now he said, carry these cheeses and see how your brothers is doing. Carry these cheeses to their captains, you know, so you can get that inside connect. You know what I mean? The captain be like all these cheese. Whoa. And the, and the captain be like, go ahead, David. And he's over there eating the cheese. David's out there checking out his brothers and checking out the battle. So while he's out there doing this, here comes Goliath, right? So now you got to understand something. You cannot be afraid of conflict with Satan. You can't be afraid and intimidated by the warfare and the attacks of the devil. And you won't be afraid when you defeat them. You won't be afraid, afraid when you resist them. You won't be afraid when you not only resist them, but rebuke them and command them to die, command them to be unsuccessful, and Satan flees. That's going to build such a confidence in you, in your everyday dealings, in every area of your life. And so when you have that kind of attitude, that kind of performance, and that kind of response from God, and that kind of response from Satan, you don't mind going to the battle. As a matter of fact, you going out there into the battle, and you got a whole different attitude, because God has done so many miracles and answered so many prayers in your life, that your confidence is at an all-time high, your boldness is at an all-time high, and your humility is at an all-time high because you know you're there to glorify God. So he goes into the camp and he takes, you know what I mean, the food to his brothers. He takes the cheese to the captain. And now, and now, wow, watch this here, verse 19. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the Valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Uh, actually, they wasn't fighting. They was just talking. I mean, they was in fight mode, but they was in the, con the, the conversational part of the fight mode, okay? But they wasn't, they didn't get physical. And I'm here to tell you, because you are a believer, whatever promise you're standing on and believing God for, if it has not physically manifested, if, it, if, if, if the physical side of the promise of God that you're believing for has not manifested, then you're in the process. Do not talk doubt, do not talk fear, do not put it off in the future, claim it in the now. Thank God for doing it. Let me say it again. Thank God for doing what you prayed. Don't put it off in the future. Bring it to the now. And now, that now faith, that now faith moves God. It gets God's attention, but it moves God because it says, God, I believe you more than I believe the physical reality because the physical reality that does not line up with the word of God, with the promise of God that you're believing for, that physical reality is currently undergoing change to line up with what you prayed and what God has promised. Fill that time in between the time you pray from the time your physical situation changes and manifest the reality that God has ordained for you. Fill that in between time with praise, service. Fill that in between time with your own consistent current development. All right, let's move on. So now, now when Saul, verse 19 again, now when Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines and David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took, the, took and went as Jesse had commanded him. 
saw the last time we was together. You, you got You're under somebody's command. I'm under somebody's command. We're all under somebody's, you know what I mean, authority. And you can't get your feelings hurt when somebody starts telling you what to do, especially when they're telling you what to do to help out and improve a situation. I know, see, giant killers get that. See, giant killers is humble. They humble. They, giant killers want to help. Giant killers want to solve problems. Giant killers want to fix things. Giant killers want to be called on by God, called on in any situation to be a part of the solution. So look at this here. Look at this here. For Israel and the Philistines, I'm in verse 24. Well, back, let me back up. And David rose, verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. All right, so in other words, you know, they're out there, ah, and they're decreeing. You know what I mean? And, and speaking what's going on in their heart. You can't just start right in the midst of a battle. But you got to stay right and you got to finish right. You can't just start strong in your speech and in your thinking. But you got to stay strong in your actions and performance so that your outcome will manifest what you're believing God for. You can't quit in the middle. You can't get shook in the middle. And it happens. The enemy ever shakes you up, throws something at you that wobbles you? Shake it off. Get back to the basics. Put your mind back on Jesus. Put your mind back on the promise. Correct any negative talk. Correct any disconnecting talk that you have spoken in the midst of that situation. Don't agree with the situation. Don't agree with what you say. Stay agreeing with God's word. Stay focused and bold with it. Start rebuking, resisting, and commanding Satan and that situation to submit to the knowledge of God, to submit to the promises of God, that's how it's done. That's how you break strongholds. That's how you conquer the devil. That's how you stay on top of the situation in Jesus' name. So now, they shouted for battle. Verse 21, for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. You got to see how they do this thing, right? So they shouting and, oh, you know, getting themselves worked up. When we get ourselves worked up in the spirit, it's through praise and worship and confessing the word. Praise, worship, confessing the word, confessing what God says about you, confessing what God says about us. We start saying, oh, I'm the head and not the tail. You start saying, I, I am with God and for God, and I always, always triumph because of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Then you start speaking of that situation. You are under my feet. You are to obey me. You are to obey God. You are to obey God's word. Then you look at God and say, God, thank you for performing your word with signs and wonders following. That's how it's done now. That's how you got to respond. That's the attitude you have to have. That's the attitude we have to have when we're dealing with problems and especially even when we're dealing with victory. Satan, I got the victory in Jesus' name and you not taking it. So keep on running. Off you go in Jesus' name. And remember, you have to, oh, you got to discipline yourself to always speak in the name of Jesus at the beginning in the name of Jesus, in the middle, every now and then, you know, in the middle of a sentence, it's in Jesus' name. You make a statement that's that's designed to, to, to correct and direct and change your now, you make sure you put Jesus' name in it. Because when you put Jesus' name, you know Jesus said, all power both in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, in my name. Oh, oh, oh yeah. This is what I'm saying. Listen, if you run up on me and I'm in a situation, the first thing coming up my in the name of Jesus, oh, no, you don't. That devil start attacking. God answers the prayer and the blessing starts increasing and, and, and flourishing and, 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 oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm blessed in Jesus' name. All right, look at this here, verse, verse 22. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Now, now watch it. Look at the humility here. Look at the respect for the brethren. Now, I said in the last time, you know, he, he was these, these are soldiers. They're soldiers in God's army. They're soldiers in, in, in Saul's army, the king at that time. So David's got mad respect for them. He, he's all excited to see him, right? 
first of all, you need to understand this here. In any conflict, if you are battle ready, what I mean by battle ready, what God means by battle ready is you have gotten the instruction and the formula to win. You've got the formula and the instruction. You know how to draw close to God. You know how to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And you know how to resist Satan and make him flee. I didn't say negotiate a freedom. I didn't make, say negotiate a freedom. Did y'all get it? A freedom and a freedom. No, you are free and you can make Satan flee when you honor God with humility and submission and obedience, when you honor God with decreeing God's, his prophetic decrees, God's predictions, God's destiny for your life through promises, when you decree those in Jesus' name, you honor God. You, 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 you set God in a position in your heart in a position in the people that's watching your life, no matter what's going on, victory or challenge, conflict. And when they see the end result of God fulfilling their word to you, to us, they're going to look at us and be like, wait, how do y'all, how y'all do that? How'd you just kill that giant? How did you just stand up in that situation and represent God? How did you stand up in that situation Without fear, without wavering, without doubt, but with praise, confidence, conviction, hope, encouragement. How did you do that? That's what people are going to be looking at you saying. Where'd you come from? Then you're going to start sharing with them your experience in God. You're going to start telling them what God has already done in your life. Look at this here. And God knows how to get you in the battle. God knows how to position you so that you can be a game changer, not only for yourself, but for other people in your life. That you could be that encouragement. That you could be that example. That you could be that stirring for the glory of God, that stirring of their faith. Because it is in them. But sometimes the devil be trying to snuff their light out, snuff their, their strength out, snuff their confidence out. That devil be trying to snuff out their attitude and performance capabilities in God. All right, so watch this here. And he talked to them. Now, remember now, God spoke to Jesse. Jesse spoke to David. David's in the thick of the battle. He's in there seeing it. He, listen, he got front row seats at this point. God knows how to get you into the battle because God has prepared you to make the difference, to be the difference in Jesus' name. And God not only knows how to get you to front row, but God knows how to get you in the game. Watch this here. And he talked with them, verse 23, on 1 first, first Samuel 17, verse 23. And he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. Now, have you ever heard people talking doubt, unbelief, negativity? They talking and praising Satan and, and, and speaking just vile and just all kind of craziness. And you'd be like, whoa, what did you, whoa, do you even hear yourself? That's coming. And we're going to do it in the most loving way. Look at this here. David heard them words. And all the men, verse 24, when they saw the man fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? First of all, he's a man. He's just a big man. But they say, bigger they are, faster they fall. Okay, they don't say faster, they say harder. No, bigger they are, faster they fall. You knock somebody that's nine foot six, knock them down, gravity going to take them down to the ground. Quit, plus with the help of God. Okay, yeah. Okay, and it shall be, look, look at this here. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Our last lesson, we're talking about the rewards of battle. And we saw that David was like, what's going to happen? Let's read, let me just read here. Look at this here, verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him saying, 
what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take away this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Your God is not dead. Your God's alive. And your God is making changes on the inside of you. You are not dead, dry, beat down, beat up. But you are alive with the fire and power of God. You are alive with the revival knowledge of God. You are alive with the potent performance of Almighty God. And I'm telling you right now, and as you and I are developing in that, our lights are shining so bright. Glory to God. So now I'm going to tell you right now, when you hear about the promise for whooping up on Satan, when you hear about the promises and the rewards for resisting Satan and conquering him in any area of life and in any area of your life, and then when you grow beyond that, conquering Satan in your own life, you now start conquering the effects and the attacks of Satan in the lives of other people by, this is how you do it, by showing them how to overcome Satan, showing them who they are in Jesus, showing them and reminding them, getting them to think about the victories God has done for them to trigger their faith into right now becoming a giant killer for God. Look at this here. This is powerful. Look at, look at how David talks about Goliath. And let me just say so. What David is saying about Goliath, he's also saying about the king of the Philistines, and he's also saying about Satan, the God of the Philistines. Let's look at this here. Look at this here. This is so powerful. He said, who is this reproach? And this is where we left off last time. We're going to move off. Now, last time I, I threw some stuff out there. If you listen to that message, I tried to be as tactful as I can. But I'm going to be full throttle right here. When David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Wait a minute. He said, who is this reproach? This is what he said. Her Paul. Watch this here. He says, who is this contumely? Contumely means insolent, rude, arrogant, disrespectful, insulting person. That's the first thing that came out of David's mouth. Now, this is what David said. Now, when we read in our Bible, we see this word reproach. If you don't know what that word means, you really don't know exactly what David said. This, what I just said there, the definition of reproach, kerpaw, this is exactly what David said. David said, who is this contumely? insolent, rude, disrespectful, insulting person. Now, so far, right, David called it the way he saw it because Goliath was hurling insults at God, at Saul, at the army, and at the people of God. We're going to see it. Definition number two of the word reproach. Who is this disgrace, this, this loss, this, this failure of reputation, Respect because of this dishonorable action that they're taking against our God, that he's taking against our God. So, so watch this. Here. This is strong now. So David's attitude when he heard Goliath talking and when he assessed Goliath. Now, David did not care about Goliath's reputation. David did not care about Goliath's past battles. He said, what's that got to do with me? You cannot care about the reputation of the thing that Satan is attacking you with. It doesn't matter if the attack that Satan is attacking you with, the attack that Satan is attacking you with was successful in a thousand Christians and a hundred of those thousands in your family. Doesn't matter. It ain't going to be successful against you because, see, you don't reverence Satan's reputation of victory over people that did not or knew the will of God and didn't stand for it, didn't fight for their rights. And when you don't fight for your rights, people will dominate your rights. And as a Christian, you got to fight Satan over your right to whoop his behind and to whoop his attacks. And how do you do that? Again, rebuke that rascal in Jesus' name, resist him in Jesus' name, and command him from the word of God in Jesus' name, and he will flee. But before you start commanding, before you start rebuking, before you start resisting, get closer to God. Build up your prayer time. Build, build up your praise time. Get, get built up. Get your peace by keeping your mind stayed on God. And in the midst of that situation, then by the time you get up from there, 
man, I'm telling you right now, I don't care what Satan's been doing. By the time you come up out of the presence of God, you coming up out of there throwing punches. You coming up out of there throwing some rebukes, throwing some resistance, throwing some commands, and Satan got to obey. He will flee. God said he would. You just got to, you got to rebuke him. You got to, you got to do the, the things of God until Satan flees. Watch this here. Called him a disgrace. Yeah, this is some serious attitude right here. Then he turned around. This is where we left off last time. He said, first of all, you contumely, you disgrace. And then he says, you who dinda. And this is what David said. Who is this reproach? Now, when David was saying this, watch this here. He was talking to the soldiers. He talking to the soldiers and the children of our of Israel's army. He talking to trained killers, trained warriors. And David said to them, who is this Pudenda? Or in other words, a Pudenda. Look it up. I hope you looked it up. A person's external genitals, especially a woman's genitals. And this is what David, this is what David said to the men. Who is this? Who is this? Look at verse 27. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be to the man that killeth him. Now they didn't repeat what David calls Goliath. They didn't repeat it. But they didn't have that kind of confidence. They didn't have that kind of relationship with God. They didn't have the kind of experiences that created that kind of attitude. David said, who in the world is this arrogant, raggedy? I threw that. He didn't say raggedy, but I threw it in there. This raggedy, disrespectful, insulting rascal. Who, who is this? Who does this disgraceful, this, this reputationless, this, this respectless, this dishonorable rascal? Who is this woman's genitalia? That's some serious attitude. Oh, okay, that was David. That's how David saw Goliath. And when we start seeing our problems like that, when we start seeing any attack from Satan like that in Jesus' name, Satan going, no, I'm dealing with somebody that's different. I'm dealing with a different breed of Christian. I'm dealing with a different class of Christian. I'm dealing with a Christian that's got a different faith level. I'm dealing with a Christian that's got some experience with God. So watch this here. Verse 28. I'm, I'm just going to say this here. You know, family means well, but you got to be careful with family. Especially family that think they got it all cranked up. You know what I mean? And, and they may have position with man, but their condition with God and you have a lot of people out there, it may not be family. They have a lot of position in the secular worldly arenas, but they're a little shaky with their relationship with God. You gotta watch how they deal with you. Look at Eliab, verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, now, first of all, when people see you getting information about whooping up on enemies, conquering and fixing problems, especially problems that they can't fix, problems that they scared to fix, problems that make them run, you got to be careful because even if you're trying to help people fix their problems, you got to watch out for anger. You got to watch that the first attack of the devil is anger. In them, you coming as a help. They angry. They, they don't want your help. They don't want you on the battlefield because they know what you're going to do when you're equipped by God, when you're a giant killer for God. Look at Eliab. Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom has you left those few sheep? Those few, those few sheep? First of all, anger, first jab. Eliab is clueless that Jesse sent David down there. Who have you left those little itty-bitty, them two tiny few sheep you supposed to be shepherding? 
That's jab number two. That's slander number two. In the wilder, you done left them little few peasley, measly little sheep in the wilderness. Who'd you leave them with? You a shepherd, I'm an army man. You, 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 you care for stinking, nasty, filthy, crazy sheep. I am a trained military soldier in the army. This cat's pride and arrogance was all bloated. Okay, look at this here. I know thy pride. Boom, jab number three. And the naughtiness of thine heart. Jab number four. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Jab number five. You got to understand, Satan going to always be taking jabs at you, always trying to break you down, always trying to talk about you, always trying to, you know, disrespect you, always trying to dishonor you. But the grace of God, you know, the number five is the number for grace, but the grace of God is on you. That's why you're there. God knows how to get you in the battle. And when attitude, the attitude of God, and performance, the performance capabilities of God, come together, it creates the miraculous display of God. And that's what you're doing. You're manifesting the miraculous display of God, and you're only getting better at it each and every time you release that attitude of God and that performance. When you start acting on the word of God, obeying the word of God, expecting God to do what God said they don't they going to do, talking about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, then you accelerate the ability of God. You accelerate the flow of God's capabilities and abilities in you and through you. Oh, sweet Jesus. Let's go on. Look at this here. <laughs> Call them arrogant. Call them naughty. You bad. This, this is what Eliab said about David. You arrogant. You presumptuous. You bad. You evil. You wicked. This is what David's older brothers felt about him and said it openly, trying to ruin his reputation. Look out for these people that try to ruin your reputation. And I don't care how many people try to ruin your reputation, try to make you look less than, try to make you look evil, try to make you look wicked, try to because you obey in God. And you got to know that family. Of course, of course, enemies. But family will try to make you look evil, try to make you look arrogant, try to make you look presumptuous, try to make you look bad physically and morally, try to make you look evil and wicked. This is what this is what Eliab said to David in front of everybody. This is the heartfelt assessment that Eliab had of his younger his younger brother. And the question is why? I'm gonna tell you why. All right, I'm gonna step out of here because Eliab was rejected by Samuel. God says this ain't God's anointing, and he went down all them brothers. That ain't the one, that ain't the one, that ain't the one, that ain't the one. This is all you got because right now, I know I didn't miss God. This Samuel talking. I know I didn't miss God. You got another brother someplace? And then all of a sudden, oh, well, there, there's David. He's out there with the sheep. He the youngest. And sometimes the youngest, when they listening to God, will be the most powerful that God will use. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, you, some, some of the youngest can be a piece of work too. But when you get the youngest that loves God and, and, and has a heart that respects and reverence God, God can do great things out of the youngest. And God can do great things out of everybody if they heart right. Okay, so look at this here. Verse 29. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Now you got to understand that. You got to understand the attitude of David. When David said, what have I done now? You this this implies that them brothers used to be all over David with this same assessment, pride and naughtiness of heart, and 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 wicked, evil, arrogant. Oh, you think you some David just because Samuel didn't come down there and anointed you king? You know they didn't believe in that anointing. You know they didn't believe in that whole that whole that whole interaction and that whole protocol that God had Samuel to do. Samuel said, well, th th is there anybody else? Is there anyone else? 
Do you have any more children, Jesse? Because I know God sent me here to anoint the king. And I'm here to tell you that God sent Jesus to anoint you as king over your situation. King in your life. And that word king means authority, royalty, ruler. Oh, how, I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what Satan has thrown at you throughout your life. Them days is over. And, and David says, wait a minute. What have I done now? Why are you jumping all at me now? You all at my throat right now. And then David turns around. This is where you got to be too in the midst of conflict. And especially in the midst of jealousy, in the midst of haters. Is there not a cause? If I'm here, God sent me. And God did send me. Because remember I said earlier, God knows how to get you in the battle. God can get you in the game, but you got to get your attitude right. You got to get your performance up. I mean, you, you got to practice. You got to be trained by God. Look at this here. Look at this here. Verse 30. And he turned from him toward another. See, at some point in time, even if it's family, talking like the devil, talking with hatred and envy and jealousy, you just got to turn your back on them, shake the dust off, and ignore them knuckleheads. I'm going to say it again. If you got family, friends, church folk, enemies, they start talking like Iliad, treating you with disrespect, envy, jealousy, hatred, shake the dust off. Just, just shake. Just, you know, I just say brush, the brush it off the shoulder. Brush it off. Look them in the eyes. Turn your back on them and don't say not another word to the ignorant rascals until they get it right. Yeah, I said it. Because this is what David did. David just turned from them. He turned from his, he turned from Iliad. I'm not letting what you say. You're talking, you're talking for the devil. You're sounding like the devil. And you're accusing me of everything except being a child of God. Ignore them rascals. Ignore them. Leave them behind you. Turn your back to them. Go to the ones that's giving you the information on how to get your reward in the midst of the battle. Look at this here. And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. What did he say? Hey, I got to ignore my brother. He on something right now. He on some kind of craziness right now. Him and Satan then got bonded on some stuff. All right. But what's going to happen to the man that whoops this guy? Look at this here. And when the words were heard which David, now watch this here. Watch this here. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and sent for him. They sent Saul. David basically said, okay, I'll fight him. I will fight him. I will kill him. Look at how David is predicting the future. And all he's doing is saying words that he believes in his heart. He's saying words that he knows that God can back. When you start quoting the scriptures, those are words that God can back. Those are words that God can perform. Oh, hallelujah. Look at this here. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no, oh, sweet Jesus. Now, this is some serious attitude right here. We ain't even seen David's performance yet. This is some serious attitude. Let me tell you something. When you talk like this, some folks ain't going to believe it until you tell them your experience with God. Even in the secular work situation, you come in there, they got a problem. You say, I can fix this here. And I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And they will look at you like you done, like you crazy, like you just talking. You know what I mean? You just running your mouth. You ain't got no heart. You ain't got no knowledge. You ain't got no backup. You ain't got no performance. Yeah, you got attitude, but you ain't got performance. And a lot of times, people will shut you down because of your attitude in God. They will not believe you because they ain't never heard nobody talk like that. This is what this is what the soldiers said uh, to the Pharisees when the, when the Pharisees told the soldiers, "Go get Jesus." Jesus out there talking for God, talking for the Father, talking for the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking for divinity. Jesus is divinity in the earth. He's talking for divinity. Them soldiers came up there and said, look, they went back to the Pharisees, empty hand. They said, where is he? We sent y'all to go get him. They said, never a man spoke like this. And we ain't, okay, we ain't, we have never heard anybody talk like this guy right here. 
Jesus, I, we ain't heard y'all talk like him. He, he speaks with authority. He, he speaks like he know what he's talking about. And what he's speaking, he performing. That's good. That's you. I almost had to repent. I was, I was about to say, that's going to be you. I'd have been, you know what I mean, in there. But that's you right now. That's what's developing in you. That's what God is building in you. You're going to speak like God, and you're going to perform with the power and the ability of God. And people are going to see the miraculous of God in every area of your life. And you coming out talking about Jesus, unashamed. You coming out talking about the Father God, unashamed. You coming out talking about the Holy Spirit, unashamed. And you coming out talking the end result. Look at verse 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. I'm telling you, whoo, glory to God. I'm really, I'm really doing my best to contain myself. Now, David then said, who is this disrespectful, arrogant? Who is this woman's genitalia? This uncircumcised, he ain't even got a relationship with God. The attack of the devil has no relationship with God. It's from Satan. You got to look at it as it is. This is an attack from Satan. And Satan, you ain't nothing but an arrogant, disrespectful woman's genitalia. Ladies, don't get offended. Don't get offended. All right? You know, when we call somebody a punk and we use stronger words, okay, look. And that's the attitude. That was the attitude of David. That's the attitude that's coming to you. Now, you may not call Satan a pudunda. Let me make sure I'm saying that right. Wait a minute. Let me, let me get it right. A pudenda. I said a pudenda. Uh, you may not call Satan a pudenda, but make sure that your attitude is one, not just gratitude towards God, but one that says, Satan, I know I'm your head, you're not mine. In the midst of any situation that you're dealing with, I know I'm your head, you're not mine. Okay, oh my God, I'm, let me see what's going on. Let me see if I can get through this here. All right, so David comes up there talking. Don't y'all be afraid of this guy. I'm going to whoop him. Look at this here. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistines to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Now, these are facts. What, what Saul said was facts. Okay. You can't let the facts of the situation out intense your relationship with God, out intense your experience with God. Yeah, okay, those are facts. But you don't understand my relationship with God and your relationship with God is growing. Your relationship with God is developing. Your trust in God is developing because you're getting more prayers answered. You're experiencing the touch of God on a regular basis. Your confidence and your conviction, your faith is growing in God. Oh, hallelujah. Look at this here. Look at this here. You know, David said unto Saul. Now, now, watch the contradiction of what Saul just said. You got to get into a place that you can re respectfully contradict the negative, doubtful, low standardizing talk that comes out of people. Being used by Satan. You say, wait a minute. They wouldn't be you. Look. Saul was under Satan's influence. Because if Saul was under God's influence, he would have went out there and whooped that devil. He would have went out there and whooped Goliath. But he had no attitude of God and he had no performance capabilities of God. David said, unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. He wasn't trying to keep the sheep. He kept the sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. That The lion took one, the bear took one. Separate incidences. And I went out after him. They took him and left with him and smote him. You're going to have to get a, a taste for smiting Satan's attacks. With the attitude of Jesus. With the performance capabilities of Jesus Christ. You're gonna to have to you have to get a you're gonna to have to get a taste for smiting Satan's attacks, smiting his thoughts that he puts into your mind, the doubts, the arguments of what you can't do, 
who you not. That's kind of like what Saul says. Saul says, you're not able to go up against them. But what then? You got to cast them kind of thoughts down. Because they'll weaken you. Oh, my time is almost gone. I only got two more minutes. Stick with me. Look at this here. Look at this here. And, 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 and I went out after them. See, you don't go chasing down lions and bears that took one of your sheep. Unless you have the attitude and the performance experience in God. And that's what God is building in you. Building in me. I'm getting better at it. I ain't going to lie. No, but at least don't take that as an arrogant statement. That's a statement of faith. But that's also a statement of fact. I mean, I mean, bless, bless God. Hallelujah. In Jesus name. You got to say this. You got to say, I'm better at this. Here. You got to get in here. Let no man's heart be troubled because of this cat. Because of this situation. God is able. And God is doing it. He sent me here. Stir your faith. You, you, he said, he said, I went out after him, I caught him, I smote him, and delivered that sheep out of his mouth. Now, I don't care if you want to look at that metaphorically. I'm looking at it both ways, metaphorically or physically. And I'm going to stick with the physical. While that lion and that bear was about to, David caught him. Listen, God know how to get you in the battle and God's timing for you to rescue God's timing for you to overcome. God's timing for you to help others overcome. It's always supernatural and it's always divine. And the timing is always right. You say, you say, well, what if, what if I missed my opportunity? Don't worry about it. God says, okay, if you repent, I'm going to send that opportunity back around like an airplane doing a pattern. You may have missed the runway the first time, but, but God says, no, don't crash into the trees. Just get, get altitude again. Fly up high, turn around, you know what I mean? Do your crosswind, do your do your final approach, and then make sure your timing is right and land that thing. Get that blessing. Get that reward. Get that exaltation. Because you got the attitude and you got the performance. Might as well get that exaltation again. He says, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. You got to get a taste for smiting and slaying satanic problems and dealing with satanic people. Put that word on. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and th listen to this attitude. I close here and I'll pick up next. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he have defied the armies of the living God. That was David's motive. That's what, that was that fire on the inside of him. That was that like, that zeal of God. And David took offense to Satan and Satan's champion. And we got to start taking more offense to the attacks of Satan against our lives, the attacks of Satan against our family members. And we got to start dealing with Satan and his attacks the way David in his attitude dealt with the attacks from Goliath, which now at the root was an attack from Satan on God, on the children of God, and on the plans of God for the lives of the children of God. Satan wanted to turn them into Satan worshipers. Satan wanted to turn them into slaves. Satan wanted to turn them into servants. But God says, if I set you free and you do what I tell you to do, Satan will flee. Because he whom the son sets free is free indeed. You've been set free. I've been set free. But what's happening is this here. What's manifesting and it's accelerating our freedom. To walk in the fullness of God is the attitude of God that we're learning, embracing, and manifesting. The performance capability of God that we're accepting, accepted, embraced, and now are performing. Yeah, talking like God, thinking like God, acting like God. Yeah, performing like God, maintaining like God, conquering like God, like our God the Lord Jesus Christ, like our God, the Heavenly Father, like our God, the Holy Spirit. That's who I'm watching. I ain't watching nobody else. I'm, listen, I am, I am not watching God's army, God's church. I'm watching Jesus. I'm watching the Father. I'm watching the Holy Spirit. I'm watching what they say, and I'm expecting them to do what they say do. I ain't gonna lie to you. Sometimes in the natural, the physical realm, things don't look like you know what I mean? They're happening, but that's where I know 
God's hand is in the situation and the situation is changing before my very eyes. Your situation, what you prayed for, what your current situation is saying, what your current situation is screaming, your current situation is talking, selling wolf tickets because Satan is using whatever channel of communication to you that he can, whether it's thoughts coming into your mind or thoughts that he put into people's mind that's coming out their mouth and you got to look at them situations and you got to look at them people and you got to look at Satan and you got to say the victory is already mine. My circumstances are changing by the inertia, by the power of almighty God fueled by my faith, my praise, my attitude, and my behavior. Your behavior, your attitude, your faith, your expectation in God is moving the hand of God to change your physical circumstances. Stay connected. Glory to God. As God gets you perfected, you're just maturing. That word perfection means maturing, getting better in the things of God. Well, my time is all gone. I'm Apostle Edward B. Haynes, Resurrection Life Christian Center Church International. It has been an absolute pleasure to be with you. And I'm telling you right now, in the name of Jesus, what God is doing in your life, what God is doing through your life, what God is doing to your life is nothing short of a miracle. And that's who you are. You are God's miracle. Well, again, my time is all gone. Hallelujah. Let's just seal this right now in prayer. Let's just thank God for manifesting and doing what they promised. And what they promised is happening. Oh, it's happening. It is ongoing right now. You are in the process of change. You are in the process of God's blessing. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. We praise you. We accept what you're doing. We love how you're building and developing us. And we thank you, Lord God, as we get these opportunities for you to get us into the action of literally defeating Satan and defeating Satan not only in our lives, but in the lives of our family, our friends, and even our enemies. We thank you for building in us the reputation, the authority, the integrity, and the absolute manifestation of Jesus' character in everything that we do. Again, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. These things we pray in the authority in the reputation, in the character, and the integrity of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Again, these things we pray in Jesus' name. Until next time, may God bless you. Shalom.